For this episode of Forage Focus, we're coming to you from the Harrison County Extension Office from the coal room. And you'll notice that we may have some falling rocks throughout the program. If that happens, we'll continue on as normal. My guest today is Erica Lyon, the Extension Educator for Harrison and Jefferson Counties. Erica, what are we going to talk about on the show today? We are going to talk about mold. Mold. Stay tuned. <laughs> Erica has been a guest on Forage Focus before. You'll recognize her from an episode last year in January about dealing with waterlogged soils and pastures. Erica actually has a background in mold and fungi. Erica, could you tell us a bit about your background? Uh, sure, Christine. So I got my Master's of Science at University of Maine. Uh, while I was there, I worked in a fungal pathology lab. Uh, while I was in that lab, I was mostly working on plant pathogens of low bush blueberry, but I also am interested in fungi in other areas and I've given talks on mycorrhizae, uh, mold in general, uh, and other related topics. With production seasons like we've had the past couple years, when it comes to hay and forages, uh, we're dealing with conditions that are a lot wetter than we have historically had, and for many types of fungi and mold that actually promotes their growth, doesn't it? Yes, that is true. So if this continues to be a pattern for us, we're more likely to see continuing issues with mold in hay and other feeds. And throughout today's episode, throughout today's episode, we are going to cover some of the types of mold that could be present in feeds, how to recognize mold uh, in the stored feeds that you have, and what to do about it once you notice that it's there. Erica has recently given a presentation about moldy hay, and she's going to share with us a lot of the information from that presentation. So Erica, where should we start when we think about molds in livestock feeds? Well, first off, we need to think about what actually is mold. Uh, mold refers to decomposing microbes that typically feed on organic matter and are filamentous or fuzzy. Uh, sometimes they can also be dusty, like how many times have you heard someone say that their hay has been dusty? Usually that's a good indicator that they have mold spores. Uh, a lot of times mold is referring, and especially when we're talking about feed, uh, mold refers to fungi. It's usually the fungi that are causing the problems over the bacteria. Uh, you also, a lot of times we don't realize we have mold until we actually see growth, but what a lot of folks don't understand is sometimes we might not see mold, but it's still there. Uh, so a good example I like to use is uh, moldy bread that you might have left in your refrigerator for maybe a bit too long. It turns a whole bunch of different colors. Uh, some people might just take the... Um, Fuzzy part off. Yeah. Uh, I think cheese. it's okay to eat it, but keep in mind that all throughout that bread there's fungal hyphae that uh, has grown there. So we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Mm, doesn't this look like it's delicious? It's pre-seasoned. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a question I get all the time, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it more as we go on, uh, but is color of the mold an indicator of safety? Color can be really deceiving. I mean, when I'm giving um, mushroom talks to folks who are going out in the spring to hunt for morels, I, we kind of cover the same thing. It's it's hard to identify fungi. There are so many similarities among species, and furthermore, you just you don't know the tox the amount of toxin a certain type of fungi will have. Uh, it's kind of like playing Russian roulette. Mm. So that means we need to be paying attention to more than just what color we see when we open mm -hmm. that hay bale. Yeah, smell can be descriptive. Um, livestock symptoms is also critical. But probably one of the best things you can do is test. And it doesn't necessarily have to be mycotoxin testing. It can just be getting a forage test done to make sure that the nutrients are there. That's really good advice. As we mentioned, the weather conditions in our part of America and beyond uh, seem to continue to get more and more wet and during abnormal parts of the year, uh, which can cause additional issues when we're trying to store feeds, 
harvest feeds, and then also feed them later on. This can have huge economic impacts on our industry. How much impact are we talking about, Erica? In the U.S. and Canada, moldy feed is responsible for up to $5 billion in losses, and that's not just from loss of feed itself, that can be from vet bills, uh, loss of animals that die from mold that might have mycotoxins in it. So there's a lot that goes into this number. Uh, it can also infect, usually what you're going to see with moldy feed is it's going to affect the entire herd. It's not just going to be one or two animals showing symptoms. Now keep in mind one or two animals might ha end up having abortions, but we're talking about very general symptoms uh, that we'll get into here in a little bit. And another thing to keep in mind is once these toxins are ingested, there's no treatments available for these animals. When we talk about some other types of, of toxicities, it seems like body size and age of the animal can sometimes uh, be a factor in how long it takes before those symptoms show up or how lethal the toxins can be. Is that the same case when we think about molds? Absolutely. Uh, certain livestock are going to be more susceptible, more vulnerable, especially when you're when you're talking about cattle. Uh, a lot of the younger calves might be more susceptible to those mycotoxins. Um, of course, when we talk about mycotoxins, we're concerned about what might get into the final milk product as well. So lactating animals, it's a big concern. We've talked about fungi quite a bit already. So before we move any further, let's talk some more about what are fungi, what makes these unique organisms. So kingdom fungi is a very large kingdom and oftentimes it doesn't get a lot of the credit that it should. Uh, it contains organisms that are both big and small. Uh, some of these might be as small as, say, single-celled yeast that we use to make beer. Uh, other ones are fairly large. Uh, Prototaxides was an, um, is a fossil that they think was originally a fungus. And if you can imagine walking into a forest of fungi, that's how tall these, these specimens were, up to 25 wow. feet in height. And then also, the largest organism on Earth is a fungus. Really? How big is that fungus? Uh, it's fairly large. It's uh, approximately a couple miles in diameter. How does that happen? So fungi grow through these structures called hypha. Now, hypha sounds like scientific jargon, but you've actually seen it quite a bit. If you've ever noticed fungi growing on, uh, for example, the bread example we had in the beginning, uh, it appears more thread-like, more fuzzy. So each one of those individual threads is a hypha. And then when these hypha grow together in a network, that's what we call a mycelium. So essentially it keeps growing further out, further outward, and that's how they can get so big. Wow. And then how do they reproduce? Uh, they were reproduced through spores, which would be analogous to plant seeds. Uh, these spores can travel quite a ways if they're uh, dispersed by air, uh, but a lot of times they can be brought in uh, by humans, on equipment, on other livestock, on the wildlife. So for example, if we've um, gone through the process of making hay and we've wrapped it as a way to protect it from the elements or to promote fermentation for silage or baleage, how does that fungus get inside the bale when we've wrapped it to keep it out? Well, with wrapping bales, you want to do it as quick as possible, uh, and that's the best way to keep it out. You're never going to keep out all, all of the fungi, but you can certainly help reduce the ones that you do not want that can cause a problem later on. So those spores are, are present in the ambient atmosphere, mm -hmm. being blown around, and we can't help but inevitably get some spores yes. in those bales. So even if we've tried to block out as much of the elements as possible, there can still be residue inside that uh, can generate growth. Yeah, and that, that once again, the longer you leave it exposed, the more likely it is to get contaminated. Would you say, and maybe we're going to talk about this more as we go on, but would the mold typically present itself on the outside of the bale or the inside of the bale first? So you'll typically find mold on the outside of the bale, or that's at least where it's first noticed. That might not necessarily be its original starting point. Uh, a lot of people will start to notice mold like maybe you see this black fuzzy growth on the outside of the bale or white or pinkish uh, or maybe you're seeing the blue green mold that's typical of penicillium. Uh, it's important to keep in mind though that most 
Most feeds have 10,000 mold organisms per gram of forage. So this equates to about 1% uh, fungal biomass of that feed source. Now, when you're starting to notice that mold, you're actually seeing growth on the surface, then it's more likely that there's about a million or more organisms in that bale, which makes up about 10% of that biomass. So that's a lot. So fungi is common in a lot of the foods that we may serve to animals and also to people, really. Fungi can be found everywhere. Mm -hmm. What are some other places we might find fungi? Well, of course we know that some fungi are good. We like them because they break down uh, materials. Uh, leaves, stems, roots, of course, if we think about this, they're also breaking down our feedstuffs as well, uh, like hay. Uh, you might find fungi on dung, of course. Um, sk our skin has fungi, if you've ever had ringworm. Uh, CDs even can have fungi. If you've ever taken a CD, if anyone still uses CDs, uh, <laughs> takes them down to the tropics and you come back and you notice that there might be all these squiggle marks in the CD. Uh, likely you've got a fungus that's eating the carbon out of that CD. I actually have some really treasured VHS tapes that grew fungi. Oh, I've got my Jurassic Park. VHS tape on display. <laughs> My Star Wars, uh, the first one, has succumbed to mold. Some other words that you might hear throughout the episode we should probably uh, define now, including mycosis. Yep, mycosis refers to a disease that's caused by a fungus. You might also hear the word mycotoxin. These are toxins that are essentially produced by the fungi as well. Uh, we've already talked about spores. Those are the reproductive unit of a fungus, so they're the analogous part, as I mentioned before, they're analogous to plant seeds. Uh, and then hyphae are the thread or filament-like structures that make up the fungus, and they're the ones that are growing out usually in a radial pattern. Fungi is everywhere, and it can become introduced into our agronomic systems through multiple parts of production, uh, from starting at crop growth mm -hmm. into harvest and beyond. Yeah, and certainly uh, probably one of the more vulnerable stages is when we're actually storing that product too. Uh, so really any time uh, that crop is there, it's going to be susceptible to mold. Uh, when you Typically you're going to see mold issues develop, and this is kind of intuitive, but it's during wet years. So what can you do during wet years to prevent mold? There's not really, you can't do anything to control the weather. Unfortunately. You could try to hold an umbrella over everything while you work. Mm-hmm, that's true. <laughs> Probably not the most efficient use of your time. So what are we left to do? So one of the things that you want to do is make sure you're checking your feed to make sure the moisture levels are in a, a good range. Uh, for hay, for example, we want those moisture levels to be at or below 15%. If you get moisture levels much above 15, and really between that 20 to 30% range, those Fungi that produce a lot of those mycotoxins and in general degrade your feed, that's where they take off. And then if we're actually making wet hay, baleage, silage, we actually need to be quite a bit more wet than that, like 40% or higher, to get the right moisture in the bale to start the fermentation process. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a sweet spot, an appropriate zone for whether you're making dry hay or wet hay, um, and then danger zones as well. So just like all organisms, Fungi have a range of environmental conditions that they prefer. If we can do our best to get our feeds dry enough that it's out of that range, we should be more in luck of reducing growth. Mm -hmm. What things can we do um, management-wise on how we store our hay and our grains to try to keep them as dry as possible? A lot, these first three points I'm going to talk about, it's common sense, and it, of course it's easier said than done. Uh, make sure you're storing that feed product at the appropriate moisture levels. Uh, keep your equipment clean. Make sure you're using good sanitary practices. And then limit the exposure of that store feed. So we talked earlier about when you're wrapping a bale, make sure you do it quickly. Uh, don't leave it sit out there. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're avoiding anything that might damage the kernel or um, adding stalks into that feed. Those tend to be more susceptible tissues that um, will bring in a mold issue. Uh, 
avoiding condensation in bins or silos. Uh, one of the ways that you can manage moisture if it's becoming a problem, uh, you might want to consider using preservatives or additives in the first and last 20% portions of the silo. And then consider microbial additives. We got to keep in mind that competition is occurring on these microscopic levels and if you encourage competition of the good microbes, they can outcompete the bad ones that we don't want. So those microbial additives can be of use. Uh, when you're using grain drying, uh, make sure you're using grain drying when the grain moisture is under 35%. And do not allow grain with over 15% moisture to sit too long. So different stressors might include weather extremes, uh, insect damage is a big one. Uh, I don't know how many of you a couple years ago had noticed if you grow corn, uh, you might have had some issues with corn earworm or European corn borer. And what I was noticing in fields that I had visited was there was a lot of mold growth around the, those areas of the plant where the insect had caused damage. So certainly insect damage is a big contributor to that. I think that birds could be a big contributor to that as well mm -hmm. when they make punctures in the ears and allow additional contaminants to get in. We have a lot of people who uh, complain about starlings and blackbirds and um, they can inter those birds can contribute to mold issues as well. Mm -hmm. Some feeds are more vulnerable to damage than others. Uh, wet hay with many seed heads or a lot of weed seeds in it are generally going to have more um, mold issues or fungal issues in general. If we think about endophytes, for example, a lot of that issue that we have with endophytes is actually within the seed head. So if we're preventing those seed heads from getting into the hay, then that is good. Uh, we also have issues with corn or sorg sorghum silage that's not packed well. And then a lot of your wet byproducts, distiller's grain, uh, wet brewer's grain, those can also be more vulnerable feeds as well. Erica, you mentioned the endophytic fungus that we have in tall fescue, our most prominent grass that grows in the region. There are other notorious fungi, uh, similar growth types that have been significant through history. Yeah, absolutely. Probably one of the most notorious fungi uh, in agriculture is ergot. Uh, ergot appeared in several grain crops uh, early on. We've known about it since the Dark Ages. Uh, and it's especially associated with rye crops. So actually, if you go back 500, 600 years ago, rye was considered to be a weed because of ergot. Uh, people used to think that ergot was part of the rye plant. And it wasn't until they started practicing different man using different management strategies, like removing the seed head, that they stopped having those issues uh, with the mycotoxin. So there's still uh, occurrences of ergot in present day agriculture, and they could still cause issues like they did uh, historically in both people and animals. So we should be aware of those ergots and the effects that they can have. Uh, on the slide that you have, Erica, we can see some damage on this uh, animal's hoof. Mm -hmm. And is that attributed to the ergot alkaloids? Yeah. Um, so there are several types of mycotoxins that can, uh, once ingested, they can cause symptoms such as gangrene to form. And in this image here, uh, you can see eventually the hoof will, will slough off. So, um, yeah, it's not something to be taken lightly. Depending on the type of digestive system, some animals may be more susceptible to the damage caused by fungi than others. This is really apparent when you compare monogastrics or simple, sum simple stomached animals to ruminants. Which one would be more likely to show symptoms faster? Well, usually the when I get calls in the office, it's normally someone had a horse that had died from feeding bad hay. So I would certainly say horses, uh, anything with a single stomach, swine, poultry, they're going to be more susceptible to a lot of these mycotoxins. When you're dealing with ruminants such as cattle, sheep, and goats, their stomachs are a little more complex. Uh, they have a lot, they have more... Um, bacteria, other microbes that are helping break down different toxins in the stomach. So that kind of gives them an advantage and they also have fermentation going on in the foregut. 
So the time between ingestion and actual absorption is longer for ruminant animals than non-ruminants, so it's more likely that it's going to have a greater effect. Well, that timing, they're definitely going to show more symptoms in terms of timing-wise. It kind of ties back to the concentration of mycotoxin mm -hmm. uh, that that fungus is producing, and it's a lot like when uh, you're mushroom hunting, a lot of fungi, you can't tell how much toxin is by looking at a mushroom, for example. Uh, for ex a good example of this is small mushrooms can actually have a deadly amount of mycotoxins where a large mushroom might not have as much, or vice versa. So mold kind of works the same way. Um, sometimes you're not going to see those symptoms kick in for a week. In fact, that's most situations. Uh, very few mycotoxins will pr produce acute symptoms. <clears throat> when we talk about those symptoms, what are the types of symptoms that we're looking for that might indicate an issue with mold? So you're going to generally see a decrease in food intake. I mean, if we go back to thinking about the moldy bread, do you want to eat that? Uh, when we think about livestock, they don't want to eat it either, and especially if you have horses, they tend to be very picky about what they eat. So that's kind of how they uh, mitigate the effects of mycotoxins. They're more reluctant to eat moldy hay. Uh, you're also, with this reduced feed intake, you're going to get a reduction in efficiency as well. Uh, you're also going to see more gastrointestinal upset, as well as a decrease in rumen activity. Uh, we already talked earlier about the ergots and inflammation and lameness, uh, gain, issues with gangrene. Uh, you can also see a decrease in fertility. Uh, a lot of those animals that might be dealing with mycotoxins, they are not going to produce as many offspring. Or you might, of course, notice an increase in abortions. And then also, in lactating animals, you're going to notice a decrease in milk production. There is a greater risk of milk contamination, whether that milk is being used for human consumption or for an offspring. And then you're also going to see inflammation of the mammary glands. Wow. So this can have a huge impact across production, and we might not notice it right away, because if you're not monitoring those aspects of production on a regular basis, you might not even notice that there is an issue for quite some time. Especially for the uh, abortion rates, if you're not preg checking, it can be really hard to identify who's pregnant and who's not, and at what point uh, did they potentially lose the fetus? What was the factor there? Did they actually were they bred and then lost their fetus, or did they have one and or did they not get pregnant at all? It's really hard to tell unless you're actually monitoring the animals. And well, this adds in another layer of complexity too. A lot of times, heifers who are pregnant, they don't show, they might not show symptoms of being ill. Uh, they will just up and one day abort. So that can also bring on another challenge as well. There are other symptoms that we might notice as well. I've heard uh, our vet talk about some really strange uh, symptoms that you might observe with mycotoxin poisonings. What are some of those symptoms? Uh, you might see circling, loss of muscular control, uh, skin lesions. Uh, you might notice something similar to what when we get ring uh, ringworm. Uh, you might notice similar symptoms in your livestock. Uh, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, a big one caused by mycotoxins is kidney and liver damage, and they, this is usually where we see a lot more um, deaths. Uh, blindness, lethargy, uh, some of the minor symptoms might be something just like slobbers. Uh, you might see a 15% reduction in milk production as well. And then symptoms may appear within a matter of days to up to several weeks. And usually with, when you're talking about liver and kidney damage, those symptoms don't show up right away. They're very slow to start to appear. And while we're talking about liver damage, uh, how would we know if, if an animal is having issues with their liver? Well, you might start to notice that when they have nosebleeds, it takes a lot of time for clotting to occur. Uh, of course, a bit when we think of liver damage, we think of yellowing of mucous membranes uh, is a key symptom. They also might have some other symptoms as well, like depression, lethargy, circling, and downers are key signs of liver damage. 
let's talk some more about uh, abortion and what happens when that fetus is aborted inside the uterus. So a lot of times mycotic abortions happen uh, when the female comes into contact with a fungus. Uh, what ends up happening is that fungus gets into the bloodstream, it can make it all the way down to the placenta, and it, the placenta has this reaction where you get more inflammation, That and it's the inflammation that ends up killing the fetus. And a lot of times you're going to see more of these mycotic abortions in uh, mucor and aspirin aspergillus fungi. Uh, typically these will occur within the last trimester, uh, six to eight months of pregnancy, and symptoms, it usually happens in one to two individuals, but sometimes you can see symptoms appear in up to 10% of the herd. Would you ever be able to see uh, any symptomology if this occurred when the animal was in later gestation and actually birth is stillborn? Does that ever happen? So you actually can. You might. I talked earlier about ringworm. You might see le circular lesions on the fetus similar to ringworm, and that can be a key sign. But you won't always see that. Uh, a lot of times uh, your vet will have to do an autopsy, and what's diagnostic is they will find fungal hypha in the stomach and the placenta of wow. that animal. But it's important to keep in mind that these fungi are not contagious. You can't spread through contact. Um, but there is no medical treatment for this. So we've established some of the importance of why we should be concerned about fungal growth in our animal feeds. What are some of the ones we should be most concerned about, Erica? Well, there are three key genuses that we have to keep an eye on. The first one is probably the most well recognized, that's Aspergillus species. Uh, there are several different ones that cause different problems in different types of feed. Uh, Fusarium is another one that uh, probably causes a lot of problems here in Ohio. Uh, and this genus can produce some toxins that are especially potent for horses. Uh, and then our last one is penicillium. We don't really hear about it too much, but penicillium uh, is what looks like that bluish green mold a lot of times. Uh, but just keep in mind that you can't rely on color to identify uh, a lot of these fungi. That is something I hear a lot as people do go back to that color and just remember that color's not a reliable indicator of safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're talking about penicillium, for example, there's trichoderma species that will look a lot like penicillium. And then aspergillus can take on many different colors. It can be yellow, black, uh, blue, green. Um, so really, yeah, color is not a good identifying characteristic. From those three genuses, there are multiple toxins that could be produced that um, impact livestock production. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for example, Aspergillus species are most well are notorious for the aflatoxin. There are, of course, several different types of aflatoxin. Aflatoxins out there, such as B1, B2, M2, um, and of course, B1 is the one that we really don't want to see. Uh, fusarium, I mentioned earlier, fusarium is one, if you're a horse owner, you might be most concerned with, and that's because fusarium, it produces a lot of different mycotoxins that affect different types of livestock, but it produces fumonisin, and that one in particular is deadly to horses. Uh, and then penicillium and aspergillus can both produce okra toxin, which can cause some issues in poultry. So another mycotoxin of concern uh, is slophermine. It is produced by a species of Rhizoctonia, which is a common plant pathogen. Uh, slophermine affects cattle, sheep, horses, and mostly it's known to cause things like slobber, or diarrhea. You might notice increased urination. Uh, and this is associated with legumes, uh, primarily black patch of red clover. So if you're looking, if you're noticing these symptoms in your livestock, you might want to take a closer look at the state of your legumes, especially your red clover. So this is a disease that would be present while the forage is growing that would then produce? Yes. Okay, so we would want to be scouting the field um, during the growing season? Yeah, and even keep in mind that mycotoxins, they tend to linger around, so if that ends up in the hay, they're likely to experience those symptoms as well. That makes sense. Aside from the concerns with mycotoxins that could actually uh, cause health issues in the animals, they also, the presence of the fungi, can also 
reduce the actual quality of the feed as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's probably where we run into the biggest issue with fungi, although a lot of us don't realize it because we don't necessarily see them breaking down those feeds. Uh, many fungi, keep in mind, are decomposers, and a lot of times we view this as an ecosystem service. Uh, otherwise, we would be buried up to our necks in dung and leaf litter and all that fun stuff. <laughs> Thank you, fungi. <laughs> <laughs> but they do break down nutrients and dry matter in feedstuffs as well. Uh, so if we have a really bad issue with mold and you do not use forage testing, a good way to develop rations is to modify those book energy values by 95% when mold is present. Uh, keep in mind mold will reduce the palatability of feed. Uh, we've already talked about that earlier, reduces intake. Uh, mold also reduces digestibility of feed, so animals are not able to absorb a lot of those nutrients that they need. Uh, mold can exacerbate the suppression of the immune system, so that makes our livestock more susceptible to different diseases. Um, they can reduce weight gain. Uh, you might see production losses between 5 and 10 percent, and that's just if fungi are present on, a significant amount of fungi are present on those feedstuffs. It is actually a lot higher when you have mycotoxins present. Uh, they cause stomach upset in animals. Uh, increases, and a lot of times we don't associate it, fungi with this, but it is actually the fungi that are responsible for a lot of barn fires because they're the ones that cause those temperatures to increase in, in wet hay. So they increase the risk of spontaneous combustion. Let's not forget that fungi produce spores, yeah. which could impact you as a farmer as well. Absolutely. Uh, spores can cause a condition known as farmer's lung. Uh, keep in mind what conditions are in our lungs. They're generally warm, humid, pretty moist environments, and those are prime environments for a lot of fungi to grow and, I don't necessarily say thrive, but cause some, some issues. So you might, you might want to see a doctor if you're experiencing chronic cough and fatigue after working with hay that might appear dusty. Uh, also, these fungi can cause heaves in horses, which is about the equivalent of asthma in humans. Erica, if we go back to preventative measures, so now we're aware that mold is something that we should be on the lookout for. We understand more about fungi, how they grow and adapt in, in systems and reproduce. Now that we're knowledgeable, and now that we know we should do more about prevention, what are some things we can do? What happens if it rains consistently over the growing season? We can't control that. What that's else a, can we do? That's a great question. Um, yeah, you can't control the weather. We want to make sure that our barns have good designs. There's good ventilation. There's not corners that where moisture tends to build up. Uh, and a lot of this can prevent those optimal conditions for mold to grow. Uh, you can use potassium or sodium carbonate that can help these are products that can be used to help speed the drying process. Uh, propionate, acetate, as well as other hay preservatives can also limit microbial production as well. Erica, right there, when we talk about those hay preservatives, um, I've had conversation with folks about the benefits of using a hay preservative and what they do. And um, the way it's been explained to me is that they can help you buy time to inhibit microbial growth while you allow that bale to dry out a little bit more. It won't work indefinitely over the entire storage period, but it can give you some additional time to get the conditions right before you put yeah. it into permanent storage. You're absolutely right, Christine. Um, a lot of these are not, there's no silver bullet, much like anything that we work with. Um, it depends is our favorite answer in extension. Uh, so certainly it, it's a tool that you can use, but don't depend on it solely. Um, making sure that you have those good areas where you're storing hay, you're not leaving them out in the elements, that's going to go a long way to preventing that mold problem. Uh, in terms of reducing risk, uh, some of the more obvious points, do not give moldy feed to more vulnerable livestock. Uh, sometimes all we have on hand is moldy feed. So just keep in mind that you can mix that with good feed to help dilute it. Uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. But you want to make sure that you're avoiding giving moldy feed to those vulnerable populations such as horses, younger animals, um, 
animals with compromised immune systems. Uh, and make sure you get your feedstuffs tested. You don't necessarily need to get a mycotoxin test done, uh, but getting your forage tested can go a long way. You can tell if there's an issue with the amount of nutrients that are available in the hay. If they seem abnormally low, then that's a good indicator that you will have a mold problem. Or if that moisture range seems out of whack, like mm -hmm. if you're getting your results back and your dry matter percentage seems odd, if you're at 20% water, then you know that there could be some additional concerns about mold. Yeah, absolutely. And that dry matter number is on even the most basic hay tests. Yeah, and keep in mind that with forage testing, it's important because it actually gives you numbers to work with. Can you really tell the quality of a hay bale just by looking at it? Just by smelling at it? It might give you some idea, but it's not going to tell what all is going on there. So some things that you want to look at on your forage test results might be acid detergent insoluble nitrogen, uh, your acid detergent fiber crude protein, as well as your insoluble crude protein. Uh, essentially these will tell you what is just passing through that animal's system and is not getting absorbed. And a lot of this happens through heat damage that's caused by that microbial activity. It might not just be them breaking it down, but through modifying the temperature. That makes sense, Erica. So we could actually see loss of those nutrients because they've been consumed by the fungi. Mm -hmm. All right, so that leads us to mycotoxin testing. Uh, when do you do mycotoxin testing? Because it can be an extra expense. Uh, you want to test when there are symptoms in your herd, and preferably not after the animal has died. Um, so keep an eye out for those symptoms. Uh, you want to use it when the symptoms, health, and performance cannot be explained by other factors. Uh, and then you also want to watch for changes in production and health health effects of large numbers of animals. Keep in mind, they're, if they're all eating from the same feed, chances are they're going to show similar symptoms. And this is different from when you see uh, poisonings from uh, contaminants in the feed, like a poisonous weed was present. More, most likely you'll have one or two animals that could be affected by that because they drew the short straw and accidentally consumed something that was poisonous. This is going to affect the majority of those animals that were at the feed bunk or at the hay bale because they were all consuming the contaminated feed. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. How do we take an actual sample to test it for mycotoxins? So much like we take uh, forage samples or soil samples, we want to make sure that we're getting a representative sample. So we're not necessarily going to need to sample every bale, uh, but we want to make sure that we're adequately sampling the ones that we are suspicious of. Uh, these might include bales that are multicolored, definitely moldy, or maybe some bales that we're suspicious of. Because keep in mind, sometimes you're not going to see that mold growing on the surface. It certainly is a good sign, or not a good sign, but a key indicator if it's growing on the surface. But sometimes your animals might be behaving weird and the feed might seem fine. Um, so that might be when you want to get it tested and nothing else is explaining those symptoms. Most of the time that I've had somebody come in and want to do a mycotoxin test, it's because they've had some animals die, they've called their vet out to try to figure out why, and through process of elimination they've come down to the feed. And then they bring the feed sample in. And then in the meantime they're holding their animals off of that feed, trying to supplement with something different. And in that time frame between getting their test back, they're very stressed on how to feed those animals to keep mm -hmm. them safe. Um, so. Like Erica said, it's, it's important to keep an eye on those animals and watch for early symptomology so you can catch it before it becomes detrimental. Mm -hmm. And also, if you have an animal that passes away and you think of mycotoxins two months, uh, two months later, yeah, if it's a couple months later and you inform your vet, there's not really too much that they can do about it because they don't have the animal to look at. And keep in mind with uh, fungi, you can actually see in some cases the fungus is present, so they can detect it, but they need that animal there to do that. How much do those mycotoxin tests usually cost? Well, it depends on what route you want to go. Uh, there are quick tests that tend to be cheaper. They generally range from $10 to $50 per 
sample. But this is more of a qualitative analysis. It's not going to give you specific numbers. It's more of a presence check. It'll tell you if something's there or not. Uh, and these ones you generally have to test for specific mycotoxins. So if you wanted to test for three different toxins, you have to get three different tests. Uh, confirmatory tests are more quantitative. Uh, and because of that, they tend to be more expensive on the range of $75 to $150 per sample. Uh, it generally takes one to two weeks to receive those results, whereas with the quick test, it's pretty quick. Uh, when you get confirmatory tests, check around with several labs, um, get some price comparisons. There's not too many labs that do test mycotoxin testing. Um, in general, basic tests, the confirmatory test, you can get multiple mycotoxin tests done. You can check for aflatoxin, DON, T2, DOS. Um, those tend to be some of the more common ones. Uh, you might have to pay more to add an HT2 or ochratoxin test. Uh, if you have horses that are showing symptoms, you want to make sure that you get that fumonacin test. Once we get our test results back, how are we supposed to interpret what we're given? So you want to make sure that you're determining the dry matter in the sample because that's ultimately what we're going to be basing our feed ration calculations off of. Uh, you want to convert the as received values to dry matter basis by taking the dry matter um, or taking the as received value divided by the percent dry matter um, that the test reports as a decimal. Uh, keep in mind that aflatoxins are going to be reported in parts per billion and the other mycotoxins are reported in parts per million. So you've got several orders of magnitude different. Difference. Why is that? Why would aflatoxin be parts per billion and the others be parts per million? It doesn't take as much aflatoxin to cause symptoms as it would in uh, the other mycotoxins. So, so, we need to small, so we need to measure it in smaller units? Mm -hmm. So that's why they do it on those scales. Oops. When we're talking about ruminant animals, as we usually do on the show, the range of safety is probably going to be higher when we look at concentrate feed than with our monogastrics. Um, but how do we create that gauge of safety, like low risk to high risk? Are there guides for us to look at to determine that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can look at, some labs will give you spore counts. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if you have under 500,000 spores, that's generally a relative low count, and that's what we usually find um, in a good quality bale of hay or um, in other feedstuffs as well. When you start to get to 3 to 5 million spores, uh, that's when you're going to want to start diluting that feed with good quality feeds. Uh, and then you're also going to want to watch those animals closely for any signs of symptoms. Once you get over 5 million spores, that's when you need to discontinue feeding because that feed is a, risk, a health risk. Erica, I've heard a rumor that you could actually test for aflatoxins with a black light. Is that true or false? So you can. Uh, it is a type of quick test, but how reliable it is, uh, really the research is out, well, not out on that. Um, but what ends up happening is that UV tends to pick up the presence of fungal metabolites rather than the mycotoxins themselves. And once again, you can't tell the um, concentration of mycotoxin just by looking at metabolites. You actually have to have a specific test for that. So you get a lot of false positives and false negatives when you use black light testing. So plausible, not reliable. Yep, and you also need very good color vision too. So if we confirm that we have mycotoxins present, what do we do next? So the first thing you want to do is make adjustments for that energy content of the moldy feed. Uh, remember that 5% rule, if you got a lot of mold on say a bale of hay, you're going to want to reduce that nutrient value by 5%. Uh, remove fines from suspect whole grains. So there are some products like alumina sil that contain alumina silicate or bentonite in them that might be marketed to reduce mycotoxins and the idea behind these is that these products will absorb those mycotoxins out of the digestive tract. However, keep in mind these products are not licensed by the FDA at this point in time for a specifically for feed. And extra label 
use of feed additives is prohibited. Erica, could we try to plant uh, mold resistant varieties of forages to help combat some of these issues? Absolutely. Uh, make sure you're talking to your seed rep uh, and asking them if they have mold resistant varieties available. This will certainly help uh, limit some types of mold growth. Keep in mind Rhizoctonia is actually a plant pathogen, so or it starts off as a plant pathogen. So if we can get resistant varieties, that would definitely go a long way for prevention. We can definitely uh, get a lot of those traits when we look at corn. Um, they're going to be marketed for that as well, beyond the aspect of an animal feed, but they do cause reductions in yields. Uh, so if you're using corn as grain or to chop a silage or so on and so forth, there's a lot of varieties that you could choose from that would be resistant to many of the, the molds we've talked about today. What are some other things we can do? Uh, you can use mold inhibitors and in dry feeds. Uh, these are good for feeds with 14% or higher moisture concentrate. Remember, 15% is kind of our cutoff. Um, restrict use of obviously moldy feed or suspected feed pending test reports. Um, of course, this is given if you have a better feed source available. Um, a moderate mold issue, keep in mind uh, you want to reduce intakes by 50% or more for about one to three weeks. Uh, and if you do this, usually you'll see improvements occur within three to seven days, uh, although that time can be extended if you have liver or kidney damage. Another tool that we could keep in our toolbox as a preventative measure against moldy feeds is to extend our grazing season as long as possible. The fewer uh, feeds we have in storage, the less likely we are to have mold issues during storage. So if we can stockpile our forages to get additional grazing into winter, um, try to reduce the winter damage in some of our pastures that are going to green up early in the spring so that we can move to those as soon as possible, watching for issues of gra with grass tetany, of course. Um, but if we can keep our animals on actively growing forages or stockpile forages, for much of the winter, we can reduce the amount of feed we have to provide from storage. Um, even if that's just partially on those stockpiled pastures with partial uh, feed of grain or hay, we could reduce the amount that we depend on those stored, stored forages um, and then reduce our likelihood that we'll have issues with mold. Erica, we really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. Uh, if people have additional questions about fungi, the fungus among us, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, they can reach me at the Jefferson County Extension Office. Uh, my phone number is 740-264-2212. Uh, you can also reach out to me via email. Uh, it's lion, L-Y-O-N, no S, dot 194 at osu dot edu. Thank you for having us here. Thanks for hosting us in the coal room. And we hope that you will join us next time for another intriguing edition of Forage Focus.